All right, this is part four, entitled Victory of Faith. So far, we have actually learned that the Lord Jesus Christ purchased the uh, potter's field, which is this earth, wrote every name on the book of life, and in order to lose salvation, you need to opt out of salvation. So in other words, your name has to be wiped out. He has you there, but you can actually opt out. You can say, I don't want to be safe. And he will respect you. He loves you so much, he will respect you. And his judgments are true because if he says, no, you will still go to heaven, that will not be a good judgment. Did you get that? Okay. Now, we learn that the Lord has left us in his testament, or although otherwise known as his will, everything, all things for our life and for our godliness. We also learn that the promises are the gifts in themselves. Now, some of those promises m might need to be fulfilled after heaven and earth pass away. Jesus Christ said, heaven and earth might need to pass away before, but my word will not pass away. So bear in mind that some of those promises, you might not be able to see them right here, right now. But if you don't let go of the promise, and if it is a promise of the Lord, and the Bible tells us that he's not a man that he should lie, not the son of man that I should repent, if he has spoken, it will come to pass. It doesn't matter the timing. He never promised the timing. This is key. He never promised the timing. In fact, that is key for faith. Why is key for faith? Because if he promised the timing, you only have faith on the timing, not on his word. Did you get that? Is he coming? Yes, he's coming. Hasn't told me yet the timing, but I know he's coming. He told me, look at the fig trees and look at everything that is happening around the world. Do you know that the end is coming when it's not the Christian that is telling you something is going wrong? When the atheist is telling you something is going wrong in this earth, you know the end is coming. Have you noticed that in the 80s and the 90s it was the Christians going around the end of the world, the end of the world? Now it's actually <laughs> the atheist. Man, we don't have 12. I mean, they had the United Nations uh, Climate Change uh, Conventions just a few months ago, two months ago. And they had these little children at the front, you know, with little words put together. We have 12 years left to turn this around or else. You know that something is going on when the atheist knows that something is going on. Now, we learned about how the Lord has given us all things. We mentioned even about the Sabbath. Do you actually know that the Sabbath is the first manifestation of God's grace? Now you might think, hold on a second, God's grace, the Sabbath, sin had not occurred yet. Now what is grace? Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. He gives it to you. Now think about it. God makes man on the sixth day. And the first 24 hour cycle after making man, what is it? Rest. Will you call that unmerited favor? They haven't worked at all. Did you, did you see that the Sabbath is actually the first, the first uh, token of grace that God gave to humanity? They didn't deserve to rest. They didn't work. And the first thing was, okay, before you work, rest. The Sabbath is the first token of grace. Now, the Lord has given us all things. I'm going to share with you an experience to prove to you that this word has power. That the one that inspired this word has power. That what I just spoken now and what I spoke in the series The Atheist God up in the North Island just last week has power and it is true in Berkeley. Now, in 1998, I was laying, laying in bed, and my wife woke up screaming. And I said, what's going on? And she had a dream. In this dream, she told me that Jesus Christ was coming to this earth very, very soon. 
And I'm thinking, well, she was not, a, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say a churchgoer or um, a believer. I'm, I mean, I met my wife in a nightclub in the middle of the 90s. <laughs> she was working there, and she was the best dancer. <laughs> so, but in 98, the Lord, I believe, gave her a dream. She, she said, God is calling me to church. She started going to church. I thought initially it was, okay, go to church. She just met and said, oh, it's on Saturday. So, whoa, I don't think they open. <laughs> but she went anyway. She left home at 8.30 in the morning. She'd show up back at home at 6.30 in the evening. And I said, where'd you been? <laughs> and she goes, to church. What kind of church is that? <laughs> I mean, I'm a modern husband. But uh, <laughs> who are these people? I said, well, you got Sabbath school, and then they got the service, and then they got luncheon, and then they got... A youth, uh, youth meeting in the afternoon, and then they closed Sabbath, and then they sort of talk a little bit, and then I came back home. Next week, I was there with her. <laughs> Who are these people? Then she says, the pastor wants to give Bible studies to me. I said, okay. So how, how does that work? Oh, he's going to come at 11 o'clock. I said, what are you talking about? At 11 o'clock, I'm working. And she goes, yeah, well, that's, that's when, uh, I mean, you're working, and he's coming at 11. I said, no, wait, tell him to come when I'm here. Now that I've worked as a pastor, I think it's beauty, you know, you get two for the price of one. But before, I was like, I'm going to sit down. I don't know who this pastor is and what is he going to tell to my wife? She first got baptized, then I got baptized. And the second dream the Lord gave to my wife, she woke up crying. And when I'm saying the second dream, this is not like my wife had dreams every day. I remember those two dreams, Okay. Because she did never remember her dreams. But she remembered this too. The second dream was this. She saw herself in a little boat in the middle of the ocean after being baptized. In the middle of the ocean. And around her, people were drowning in the ocean. And a voice from heaven came and said to her, bring, bring that person inside the boat. Get closer to the people and bring them inside the boat. And she said in the dream, no, because if I get closer, they're going to grab my boat and they're going to sink the boat. And again, get closer to the boat. And so in her dream, she grabbed one person, put that person in the boat, and the boat grew. And then she put another person in the boat and the boat grew again. And she got excited and said, that was the dream. We need to share it with the people. The Lord is coming. And we need to rub shoulders with the people. We need to love the people. And we, we need to bring them back into the boat. So the Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 became a real verse for us. You are ambassadors for Christ as if God is splitting through you. Therefore, we implore you, be reconciled with God. And, uh, and, and that, was, that was the beginning. That was the beginning. After I mean, I got baptized uh, because of her, and that was the beginning. I was, we were on fire for the Lord. You know, a real fire for the Lord, a real desire for the Lord. Now, when we came here in, to New Zealand in 2012, what the messages that I share about forgiveness was what the Lord was working in our hearts. Forgiveness, I mean, my wife, if you watch her testimony in 2012, very powerful testimony, a powerful testimony of forgiveness. And um, so why we share what was the Lord, what was, what, that was what the Lord was taking us through. Now in 2014, my son was 14 years of age. And the Lord started revealing to us through, through our personal devotional time, the character of God. We started looking at God in a total different way. We started looking at the consistency of God's character, even in the Old Testament. And that's how the Atheist God series came about. It was actually our journey that became an entire series. In 2016, we went to Spain uh, uh, at a union-sponsored evangelistic programs. And uh, we presented in Spanish the Atheist God. A total new, for us, new focus on God that uh, basically the emphasis was that God was not bipolar. God was not actually using evil in order to bring good. That was the weapons of the enemy. And we were able to look through the ministry of Jesus Christ all through the Old Testament and realize that God was good and He was loving always. 
we were able to look at the seven plagues and notice that, whoa, God was good and God always was good. By the time the meetings finished, I asked the question, which was the same question that I asked last week in the North Island. How many of you that have been Christians for more than 10 years have for the first time seen God in a new, amazing, glorifying, beautiful light? And pastors and the wives of pastors and Christians for more than 30 years rose their hands and said, we have never seen God this way in our lives. And thinking, whoa, if we as Christians never see it, what's the hope of the world? And if we don't see the God's character, what are we going to show the world? That's how the atheist God was born, 2016 in the English version. And now, thanks to uh, Autumn Leaves Ministry, uh, in, uh, in here in New Zealand, we're able to record it in, in English. Please get a copy of that. Not because I'm in it, but the message that is in it is of vital importance. I believe is the message of the fourth angel in Revelation 18, the glory that illuminates the earth. And I remember one lady in 2016, the wife of a pastor, came to me crying and said, I've never seen God this way, but I need to tell you something, Oscar. What you have done here is not just reveal the character of God. You have revealed the character of the devil. Watch out. Watch out. Because the Lord is going to take you through experience to make sure that you certified this message as real. I want to share with you a quote that is in my study Bible. The Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ advises in Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Now notice, whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission. And all things are permitted, work together for good to them that love the Lord. And I said to this lady, do you know what? The Father's glory and the Father's presence encircle Christ, and he encircles us. Whatever comes, it comes from our Father that loves us, and if he permits it, Glory be to his name. As we came back, the Lord wasn't done with us. Then he started showing us about the testament, about the fact that he has given us all things to live a life that we so longing to live. A life that we don't need to work for is being given by a heavenly father. And we took it. We took it. And I pray, Lord, give me an opportunity to share it. And they call from New York. And when they called from New York, for Bronx, New York, they called me six months before. We booked the tickets. And for six months, we were praying, Lord, we claim by the blood of the Lamb that place in the map. We claim the people that will be coming. And we call a number of friends and pastors and, and uh, spiritual people that we know. Can you please play, pray for the Bronx, we're running a campaign that we believe that it, it, it will enhance people's experience on the Christian walk. It's, talk about the, it's, it's about the war of inheritance. So I was flying on a Thursday. And on the, Friday, on the Monday, that same Monday, we went to the doctor with my wife. She had had an MRI done because he was not feeling very well. And when the doctor turned the screen. We could see her liver with a lot of spots all over and the abdomen. Do you know what my wife said? She looked at me, she smiled with a famous Veronica smile and said, praise the Lord for our inheritance. She left that room and said, I'm a, very, a, a bit concerned with the doctor. I think he's a little bit overweight, you know, and hopefully he's not going to die of a heart attack. We walked into our, our local health food shop 
And the lady from the health food shop looked at my wife and she said, here walks in a very healthy looking woman. She smiled and said, praise God. So that was, then we broke it to, the, to, the, to, to our children. And it just happened that that weekend, friends of ours from Western Australia had spent the weekend with us. We have not seen them for at least, whoa, 10 years. And just that weekend, and they were there on the Monday night as we broke the news to our children. Because the doctor said to my wife, this is palliative uh, situation. The only thing that we can do is administer some chemotherapy or radiotherapy just for palliative care. You know what my wife said? Oh, praise the Lord, I don't need to make that decision. Because she always thought, you know, if I ever have cancer, because, uh, you know, my grand- grandmother died at the age of 30, my, ma- my, gran- my great-grandmother, my gr- grandmother, my mother, that's why she was given into adoption. You need to watch her testimony in 2012. Um, if I ever get it, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to face the, the, the situation of having to choose with chemotherapy and so on. I don't want that to have an option because I don't want to, I don't want that option on me. So when the doctor said, there's nothing that we can do, my wife looked at him and said, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> now, I'm on a Tuesday now. We share the news with the children on the Monday. I'm on the Tuesday at six in the morning or five in the morning in my living room and trying to work out how am I going to call the people in the Bronx and tell them I'm not going. We just got some heavy news and I'm not going. And the meeting is meant to be for two weeks. I meant to run the meetings in, in the Bronx and the other second week had to be in, in, in the um, High Manhattan or Upper Manhattan, whatever it's, it's called, High Manhattan, Upper Manhattan. So uh, that was the second week. And uh, I was trying to work it out. My wife walks in and looks at me and said, praise the Lord for our inheritance, isn't it? I'm thinking, I'm going to call them. I'm not going. She looks at me and said, yes, you are. What are you talking about? If you don't go, I'm going to my mom in Sydney for two weeks. Because I already made up my mind that I wasn't going to see you for two weeks. So I'm going up to Sydney and coming back two weeks after. You going. And I said, no, I'm not going. I'm not that bad of a husband. I'm not going to leave you just like that with this news. I said, you are going, she says. You know why? Because we've been praying for the Bronx for six months. You've been calling everybody. You reminded me, Veronica, are you praying for the Bronx? Are you praying for the Bronx? Are you claiming? Are you thanking the Lord for the Bronx? For six months, you win on my ear. And now you're not going? No, you're going. (laughs) Because God does not lie. And we've been claiming promises for souls in the Bronx. And now you're not showing up? You need to be God's answer to prayer. That morning, our our, our friends that were staying in another house in the property, not our house, but another house in the property, came down and said, Oscar, we know that you were thinking in going to New York. I want you to know that my, myself and my wife and my daughter, they're going to, we're going to stay here for the two weeks. We're going to look after your wife so you can go at peace. That brought me to tears. At that moment, I knew the Lord needed me in New York. For whatever the reason, He needed me in New York. So I went to the airport early in the morning on the Thursday. The people in New York didn't know anything. I went to the airport. I almost missed the plane. I'm the type of guy that I'm there three hours before sitting. I'm happy waiting in the airport. I stress in the middle of the freeway. So all of a sudden, I left quite plenty of time. There were roadworks. It was a whole crisis. I almost lose, uh, I almost uh, didn't catch the plane. I got there. There were 14 different uh, stations to actually um, register your luggage. This Chinese guy comes, because I was flying through China into New York. This Chinese guy comes all just to me. And he says to the lady, this gentleman needs to put his laptop. Now, all my materials was was on my laptop. He needs to put his laptop in the suitcase. I'm thinking, I never had to do that. They say, well, now it's new law in the United States of America. I'm looking both ways, and people are carrying their laptops in their backpacks. And I'm thinking, what about them? And they said, well, you need to put it in here. You need to put your laptop in here. Okay, so I put it in there. I quickly claimed claimed that bag by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, (laughs) I know how they treat these things. 
protect my laptop, Father. The lady goes and looks at me and said, take it out, take it out. Take it out, you're going to lose it. So I take my laptop and put it in my handbag, and I'm about to leave, and the gentleman calls me again and said, excuse me, we've got a problem. Your name is Oscar, middle name Sandy, and surname Hernandez. I said, no, 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 my passport is a compound, co co uh, compound surname, Sandy, which is my father's surname, Hernandez, which is my mother's surname, and he has a hyphen in the middle. That's my document. When they booked the tickets from New York, they put Sandy as my middle name. And he said, you're, they're go you're going to be sent back from China. Chinese authorities are very particular with the names, and you are going to be sent back. I looked at him and said, uh, no, I'm not. I said, how do you know? Because I need to get to Bronx. I already knew the Lord needed me in Bronx for whatever reason. So I said, you, said, you are going to send back. No, I'm not. Now, I only had two, uh, uh, about an hour and a half from landing to catch up the plane to New York in China. The plane from Australia was two hours delayed before taking off. And I was smiling. Do you know why? Because I knew that the wrestling was not in the plane. The wrestling was last Tuesday when I was wrestling with the Lord. When I was at peace of going to New York, I was fine. So I arrived there. There was half an hour for me to run from one terminal to the other and be able to catch the plane. And they, were, they started to call. People going to New Delhi. People going to New, New Delhi. And nobody was going to, to New York. And I rise up and said, New York. They didn't even look at my passport. And I don't know if you've been through China, but they have very, very sophisticated, you know, they were like three passport controls. I said, New York, my plane is leaving now. They didn't even look at my passport. I walk into the plane. I arrive in John Fitzgerald Kennedy Airport in this huge plane going to New York. There was only one suitcase missing. And that was mine. It was 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm going, oh, man, he is upset. The devil is upset. Something exciting is happening. I, you know, some, I go outside, 2 o'clock in the morning. I forgot my mobile in, in Australia. I had no contact. I've been inside waiting for my suitcase, putting a, a form for reclaiming, etc. for three hours. I walk outside of the airport, and a lady comes and said, oh, Pastor Oscar? I said, yes, you're waiting for me? He said, no, I'm actually flying to Florida. I just recognize you, recognize you from the TV. And I said, oh, so you're not here to pick me up? He said, no, is somebody picking you up? I said, yes. Uh, who is it? I said, I don't know. I said, oh, hold on a second. There was a pastor and a wife that I recognized from another church. They were upstairs. I'm going to go and get them. So she got them, and sure enough, they were, they, those were the people that were meant to pick me up. I preached the first sermon, and I said, the Lord has brought me here because he has not taken me from the side of my wife in these moments after she's been told that she has terminal cancer. For nothing. There is one person here, one person that I have prayed for the Lord to give me here in the Bronx. One person. When I finished the first message, there was at least 20 people at different times that came to me and said, it was me. Oh, praise the Lord. And then somebody else will take me on the side and say, you know, it was actually me. It was actually, it was actually me. I don't know how did that. Let me just go there. All right. It was actually me. The second day, I preach about Jeremiah Pottersfield. Remember, those that were here, the Pottersfield of Jeremiah. It was 9.30 in the evening on a Sunday. The church was empty now after, after the sermon. It was 9.30. Everybody went home. Only the pastor, the organizer of the meetings, and myself. We go out of the church into the dark of the Bronx, and this, Afro, uh, 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 this um, Afro-American woman came and said, Does this church offer prayer? And I said, Yes, sister. What brought you here? Where do you live? About three or four streets down. And I'm looking around, and it's pitch black. And I don't know if the Bronx is safe or not, but the movies don't say that, <laughs> that it's very safe. 
and it's 9.30 at night. And this woman is pregnant. And she says, I might lose my baby. They told me that I'm high risk. They're bringing me into the hospital tomorrow. I'm in desperation. And she walked four streets because she saw a church open at 9.30 at night with light in it. And it was only three people there. And I said, can I pray for you? And she said, yes. And I said, can I pray for the baby? And she says, yes. I said, what's the name of the baby? And she says, Jeremiah. <laughs> I'm thinking, sister, this is going to be good. It's going to be well. Do you know why? Because the very thing that God wants to answer has already answered. He brought you here, and I just preach about Jeremiah's inheritance. So I pray for that baby that it will be a blessing for his, fam for, for his family and for those around them. By the end of the series of the first week, there were baptisms. There were people that gave themselves to the Lord. Even one policeman that just walked into that church dressed like a casual dress because there was a, a problem with a, with a, a person that, that was intoxicated outside of the building. And, the, and this policeman that was friend with a member of the church, was also a policeman, came about just to, to help out with this person that was intoxic intoxicated outside of church. He stayed in for the sermon, and it was one of the people that stood up to give his heart to the Lord. That day, he just came because there was somebody intoxicated outside and stayed for the sermon, and he gave himself, his heart to the Lord. I gave the Lord two weeks. However, the organizers said to me, Oscar, we didn't want to tell you this, but just before you came, the second week was canceled, and we were stressing out because we brought you here for two weeks, and we couldn't fill up the second week. They double book that church in, in Upper Manhattan, they double booked themselves, and now they got two speakers at the same time. So we were trying desperately to find another spot, but now we decided that we're not going to fill up another spot. You have blessed us. You know, there has been a blessing in our church. We just paid your ticket back. You can go back to, to Australia. So I gave the Lord two weeks. He brought me back in, after the first one with a real blessing in the Bronx. I arrived in China again. When, I'm arri when I arrive in China, I have this overwhelming feeling called Veronica. Call Veronica. Call Veronica. Like urgent. I felt like urgent that I needed to call. I rushed into the transit terminal. And remember, I forgot my mobile. So my only communication was going to be through email or through Skype. So I tried. I went to the hotspot. I put the code and nothing was working. I went to the, to the in, um, help desk. And the lady said to me, uh, half English, half Chinese, uh, no internet, there's no internet. I said, no, you don't understand. I need internet. I need to call my wife through Skype. Can I use your internet? And she said, no internet. I said, oh, this overwhelming feeling, call, call Veronica, call your wife. I sat at a, uh, at a particular place. I opened my, opened my laptop. Call Veronica, call Veronica. So in the laptop, you have that kind of, bar that says no internet. I open a Skype, no internet. Call Veronica, call Veronica, call Veronica. And I call and started ringing. I called to her Skype in her mobile and started ringing. And I think oh, it's going to drop off because I'm looking at it and it has no internet. And my wife pops up in the screen and she starts crying. And I said, oh, what's happening? And I said, isn't he so good? And I said, why? You know, I was having some pain in my liver. And I said, oh, oh, oh Lord, I don't know where Oscar is. I don't know if, if he has arrived to China, but can you get him to call me? And for the last five minutes, I said, Lord, if he pleases you, could you get him to call me? And you just call. Isn't he good? And I said, guess what? I said, what? I don't have internet. I said, what are you talking about? You're talking to me through Skype. Honey, I'm looking at it. I don't have internet. I opened and he said, no internet connection. I started talking with my wife through Skype. And Skype is, is a very popular, you know, uh, logo and so on. All of a sudden, I'm looking back and there's about 20 Chinese people around me. They think I'm the hotspot. They're looking at each other, they're moving their mobile, they're, they're talking to each other, thinking, how does, he, how does he have? 
the entire terminal is all behind me. So I'm talking to my wife for an hour, and one lady that speaks Spanish from one of the South American countries taps me on the shoulder and said, when, when you finished, um, can I call my mom? Because, you know, she's probably waiting for me and uh, for me to call, and there's no internet in the terminal. And I said, I know. I said, but you got internet. I said, I don't. <laughs> and I said, how can you go? He said, Great, God is good. <laughs> for an hour and a half. Now, it was just amazing. I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to stop it. I said, man, if I stop it, I said, look, we'll try. So I finished with my wife. And she said, well, the only problem is that I need to call my mom to her land, land, landline. That means that you need to pay when you're using Skype to a, to a regular phone. You need to pay. And I had $16.20. Notice that I recognize $16.20. That figure is going to be there forever. Because I said, call, I got enough money. She calls her mom in South America. The mom answers, and they start talking in Spanish. And I'm just looking, because two minutes pass, and I've got $16.20 credit. And four minutes pass, and I've got $16.20 credit. And I put my, my hands to my mouth. I go, oh. And she goes, oh, sorry, sorry, you know, I'll finish soon. I said, no, no, don't finish. <laughs> go on. Go and speak. He's not charging me anything. And she's looking at it. And then she keeps on talking and looks at it. And she looks at me like, how are you doing this? I said, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing absolutely anything. This is God. God is doing it because my wife, at that particular moment, she needed me. And God, in his mercy, gave me that as a token of his love towards us. That he never leaves us, never forsakes us. Oh, he's so good. He's so good. You know, I arrived back. My wife kept on working. She was fit as a rock, you know, like when years before when we ran the marathon, the, the running of the marathons were all, all my idea. Many crazy ideas that I had. <laughs> she always said yes. We crossed Australia on a push bike. <laughs> she said yes. It took us 80 days. We ran mara uh, uh, the marathon, and the marathon's idea was just my idea. The first marathon, she ran the marathon 20 minutes before me. She was waiting there at the finishing line. I said, man, it was your idea. What happened to you? 20 minutes later, I arrived. <laughs> you know, I thought that somebody was moving the finishing line all the time. <laughs> so she was still happy, still strong. And one day, the Lord reminded us something. He reminded us, I've got ears, I heard. I've got ears, I heard. When he reminded me that, I walk into the bedroom and my wife says, she was doing her own morning devotion, and she said, we're not going to ask for healing any longer. He heard. We're going to just get on our knees and pray for everybody else. We've been so selfish. We're going to pray for such and 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 such. And we went every day through the book of praying. And once we prayed, the next time that we covered that name, we thank the Lord because he heard. That means that we believe that he heard. We thank him. And my wife says, from now on, we only for your glory, Father. Whatever you decide, for your glory. For your glory. Nothing else for your glory. Do you know how exciting it is, friends, when we have people, lo beloved, beloved ones of, 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 of our friendship, uh, of our church, coming to our house and looking at us, going through this, my wife with terminal cancer, and telling us, we want what you have. That's like, you're crazy. We're sick. We're struggling in our health. Because we were not struggling in anything else. We were rejoicing like this was just amazing. It was just amazing, friends. You know, the first time that I went an entire night without sleeping, and there were many of them towards the last 12, month, 12 weeks of my wife's uh, stamp here on earth. The first night, I slept about 15 minutes. And we were praying and thanking the Lord and, and going through the names of, of the list and praising Him and singing hymns and so on. 
And I said to my wife, I have only slept tonight 15 minutes. And she goes and said, praise the Lord. And I said, 15 minutes, honey. And said, hey, you always wanted to pray all night. <laughs> Answer to prayer. <laughs> For three weeks, we slept a total of five hours. Not five hours a week. Five hours in three weeks. And in the morning, I would say, oh, I'm going to crash. And I was just so excited, so, so, so energetic that I, that, that was supernatural. My wife said to me, you know, this has, this has never been a battle against my health. This has always been a battle against my faith. Do you know that the devil is not interested in your house? He will take your house to take your faith, but he's not interested in real estate. Do you know that the devil is not interested in your health? He will take your health to take your faith. He will touch your children to take your faith. The only thing that is interested upon you is your faith. Nothing else matters. So I will walk into the room and I said, how are you feeling? She looked at me like this and said, don't ask me how I'm feeling, because I'm feeling like, uh, I feel like, uh, I feel like, don't ask me how I'm feeling. Ask me how I am. How are you? I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, she said. By his wounds, I have been healed. I am his daughter. Those that believe in his name will never perish, perish but live forever. That was amazing. So, 10 weeks before she fell asleep, a palliative care nurse came to her house just to check on her because the Lord actually took away all pain. There was no pain, nothing. So, 10 weeks before, this palliative care nurse came and my wife looked at him and said, you look like a good man. I'm going to pray for you. And uh, we were just rejoicing with the palliative care nurse in the house. He takes me to the living room and said, Oscar, can you... Can I talk to you for a sec? I said, yeah. Now, you need to appreciate that I do this for a living. I go to people's houses in palliative care. I mean, it's a good thing that you, your wife doesn't need any morphine or pain relief. That's, that's a very good thing. But um, it's very strange. The situation here is very strange. I said, why is that? I said, she's happy. I said, oh, she's happy. And you're happy. I'm happy. And I said, and, uh, and you, can tell, you can tell that you love each other. Oh, we love each other. She is my soulmate. And you're happy. You realize that um, unless something happens, she's going to fall asleep. I said, yep. But we are at peace with that. You know why? Because the Father's glory and the Father's presence circle us. Whatever comes our way, the Father in His love has allowed it. And everything will work together for good for those that love the Lord. Now, two weeks before she fell asleep, the same palliative care nurse came again. My wife looked at him and said, how are you doing? I will sk skip the name. How are you doing? I said, good. We're praying for you. I said, yes, God is good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And he was puzzled. He was puzzled. You see, what that experience showed us was this. What is real is the word of the Lord. That is real. The circumstances are not real. In fact, that's why the Bible calls it, though you walk through the shadows of the valley of death. There's just shadows. My wife will say, this is just irrelevant. Whatever happens to me is totally irrelevant. What I know is that my heavenly daddy is the only true father that I have met in my life. And he will not let me down. Even if my circumstances appeared that he's doing so. Even if heaven and earth need to pass away, his word will not pass away. He is my redeemer and my redeemer liveth. He is the one that forgave all my iniquities and healed me from all my diseases. That was one of her, her favorite verses. He has healed me past tense. I'm just waiting for that to happen. But he has already healed me. I only saw my wife crying in very few occasions, on just one particular occasion. I walked into the room about two weeks before she fell asleep, and she was crying. And I said, why are you crying? 
and said, Oscar, I'm praying to the Lord. Lord, show me my sins if there's anything else that I need to give. And Oscar, he was crying and said, I can't find anything. And I said, and why are you crying? The Lord has purified you and made you white as snow, prepared you as a virgin to himself. Why are you crying? See, she was looking and he couldn't think anything. She couldn't think of any sins, any people that she had not uh, reconciled with or asked forgiveness for. Uh, she couldn't think of anything. Friends, that good, that's good news when you soul searching your, your soul with the Holy Spirit and He shows you nothing. That's good news. And see, at, the, at, that, at that moment, she wiped out her tears, lifted her, hand, her hands and said, Hallelujah, He's good. Two weeks before she fell asleep, we got married again. We recommitted again. I said, I told you, you won't get rid of me. You are my girl. And I'm going to go with you to witness to all the unfallen worlds with you. You are my wife forever. You know, some, some husbands are saying, huh, I'm hoping my wife passes away and, and there's a new s sort of situation in heaven. Well, I don't know what will happen in heaven, but I'm going to rub shoulders with Veronica. She is the hottest Chilean in the Southern Hemisphere, and there's a lot to say because Chile is in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> so she was getting weaker. Still no pain, but getting weaker. And on a Wednesday, on a Wednesday at 6 o'clock in the morning, my son entered into the room, or oh, before that, sorry, that night, my son was driving at 12 o'clock in the middle of the night. She needed to go for a drive. And uh, I called him and put mom on the phone. And mom said, son, I want to tell you that mom's lo mom loves you. And I'll be waiting for you. Mom always loves you. And always loves your sisters. And Lucky and Akayla. So that morning, my son came at 6 o'clock in the morning and gave her a kiss. I don't think she, I she even uh, remembered that kiss. You see, she had trouble to sleep that particular night, and I, will put, uh, I put my head on her pillow, and I will say, the Lord is my, and she will say, shepherd. I shall not, and she will say, want. He leaded me, and she will finish the sentence. And we went like that for 30 minutes until both of us fell asleep. So 6 o'clock in the morning comes, my son gives her a kiss, and she doesn't even wake up. But at 7 o'clock, God is merciful. God is so good. At 7 o'clock, I'm praying next to her. And she has one hand underneath the doona. And the other hand is above the doona. And she all of a sudden lifts up one, one arm, the free arm. And she starts smiling and laughing and looking at a corner of the room. And I said, are you okay? And she doesn't even notice that I'm there. She's laughing and smiling. And, um, and I said, are you okay? And she's laughing. And I said, is Jesus talking to you? And she goes, Oscar, he's talking to me. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Don't joke with those things. Because I couldn't see anything. It was dark in our room. Oscar, he's talking to me. I said, oh, what is he saying? He's saying that I am his daughter. I will never die. I will live forever. I said, oh, blessed Lord. She goes, hallelujah, with the arm like that. I gave her a kiss on the forehead, and I said, I'm going to have a shower. I'll come back soon, okay? I went to the shower, and I was 20 minutes underneath the shower. 20 minutes. That was my escape therapy. 20 minutes under the shower. I came back into the room. She had the arm up, smiling and laughing. The eyes just full of energy looking at a corner of the room, and I said, are you okay, honey? And she said this, three, two, one, go. She put the hand down, and she fell asleep. The way I picture it is like Veronica, like a little daughter, and Jesus Christ like the big father with the big arms and said, jump, my daughter, I got you. 
jump my daughter, I've got you, and grab her. From the moment I said to my wife, I love you forever, until the moment she will wake up, it has only passed for her 10 minutes. I can't wait to be there. So that was 7.30 in the morning. I called my son. My son came from work. At 8 o'clock, I sent a WhatsApp text to my friends and family in Spain. She is sleeping in Christ. That's 8 o'clock Australian time. Back then was 12 midnight Spain. At 9 o'clock, I have not called anybody, nor the palliative care nurse to sign the certificate of death. And at 9 o'clock, I walked into their bedroom. I said to the Lord, if my wife falls asleep in front of me, I will ask for the resurrection. If it is for your glory, it will be a bigger miracle. So I was there in my bedroom. I got hold of the, of the bed, and there was my wife. I was about to say, Veronica, in the name of Jesus, rise. And at that moment, I felt a hand on my, on my chest, and I whispered on this ear, saying, it's okay, Oscar. Everything is fine. It's okay. So I couldn't say it. I left the room. I gathered the children in the living room. We knelt down and said, there has been a victory today. There has been a victory today. Mom has not lost a battle of cancer. She has actually won the battle of faith because the health was never the battle. The faith is the battle. Do you believe what he says despite of your circumstances? He works, friends. He works. He is real. His word does not move. That was Wednesday at 9 o'clock. On Friday, a friend of mine from Spain called me. The funeral was going to be in a couple more days. And this friend of mine called me and said, Oscar, I just want to pass my condolences and I want to share with you something that it might be of encouragement to you. When we received the message from WhatsApp, through WhatsApp, it was midnight here, and we, we were just leaving Madrid, heading to our home, two-hour drive. My husband was driving. I was looking through the window into the dark of the night, and I was crying. I was crying. And about an hour later, must have been 9 o'clock in Australia, about an hour later, I don't know, because I never had this experience before, Oscar, but it was, it was like I saw a movie. I don't know if it was like outside of the window or in my head, but it was like a movie. And you were there next to a bed. And she made some, some short descriptions of the bed. And we have a funny bed. And it was my bed. And she made some descriptions, descriptions of the wall. And it was my bedroom. Friends, this person has never been in Australia. She lives in Spain. And said, and you were about to ask for the resurrection, Oscar. And I said, oh, Lord, see, if what I'm seeing here is true. If what I'm seeing here is true, I'm going to add my prayer to Oscar's prayer. Oscar, at that point, there was a tall, shining angel in that room that put his hand on your chest, knelt forward to your ear, and said to you, it's okay, Oscar, it's fine, everything is okay. And then I lift up my hand and said, if it is okay with you, God, it's okay with me. Oscar, I don't know if this might be of an encouragement. And I'm on the other end crying because God is so good. He gave us that token that he has everything of his children under control. People tell me, Oscar, you shared Veronica's testimony at the funeral and you were not crying, you were excited. And then said, have you ever seen people crying in victory? This has been a victory. Two weeks passed. The palliative care nurse comes to our house. He is the one that signed the certificate so they could actually remove the body. Two weeks after the funeral, he comes. I'm sharing with him the overwhelming testimonies that are coming back unto us from Veronica's last hours of life and testimony. We recorded this, this message in Spanish, and within, within days, there were thousands of people that watched it. And I'm telling him that Veronica's testimony has touched many people's lives. This is the palliative care nurse that does this for a living. And he's sitting in my living room. 
And he looks at me and he starts crying and says, your wife's testimony, Veronica's testimony has touched my life. And I said, oh man, I looked at him and I just realized, oh God is touching your heart. And he goes, yes. And I said, tell me. And I said, when I walked in here the first two days that I came, the only two previous visits, there was something here. But when I walk into the room to actually certify her death, Oscar, she was still smiling. And I realized that what she has present, what she has, I don't have. And I've never seen it in all my years as a palliative care nurse. I said, do you want it? And he was crying and said, I want it. So he was only there supposedly for 20 minutes visit. He was there for two and a half hours, enough time for this Spaniard to be able to use by the Lord to share the gospel of salvation and reconciliation of Jesus Christ with him. We cried together. I prayed for him. He walked into his car. He was in my driveway for three minutes sobbing. And since then, we've been, we've been keeping in touch. He's doing so good. He is he's just, you know, I'm talking to him on the phone, and I say, God bless you. And I say his name. I say, yes, God bless you, Oscar. He's just amazing. And I'm thinking, Father, one. You gave me one. And God impresses my heart and said, no. Do you think that dream about the boat is over? Do you think the dream about Veronica bringing people inside the boat and the boat growing, do you think that vision is over? My wife is for a big surprise when she wakes up. She is for a big surprise because many will be brought to the Lord when they see a testimony of faith that works despite your circumstances. What are you going through? It doesn't matter because that is not the battle. Your faith is the battle. The enemy wants to rob your salvation. He doesn't want you to die, friends. He wants you to curse God and die. I don't know what you're going through with your children, with your spouses. I don't know what person you have not forgiven. But I'm going to tell you one thing. There are two groups of people that are dead. The ones that have given themselves to the Lord and the ones that didn't. They are dead. They are buried. They are sleeping to wait for their reward. But there are three groups of people that are alive. The ones that have given themselves to the Lord. And I want to say, I want to consider myself in that group. So though heaven breaks so the earth opens, I will not let you go until you bless me, Father. And there's a group on the opposite side that they're making their, their minds already. They made this, their minds already. And though heavens open and the earth opens up, they will not allow the Lord to save them. And then there's the third group. The third group that eventually will be going to one or the other, to one or the other. One person now that might be listening in their homes or even here, they're wondering, you know, maybe something will happen in my life, something, maybe I will wait for something, one particular event, and I will just then go to the Lord. That means that because the Lord is not as slack concerning His promise, but he, he doesn't want you to perish, He will have to wait for you. And if you're taking two years to say yes to the Lord, you're actually delaying the hug of Oscar and his wife for two years. Did you get that? Don't make me wait. <laughs> I know I have eternity, but the longest that I've ever been away from my wife, besides these last four months, because friends, this has only been for four months. Do I sound like a widower? Because I haven't lost my wife. My wife is sleeping. She's safe, protected. I haven't lost her. I know where she lives. She lives 40 k's from me. She's sleeping there. I'm married. Two days ago, friends, my, my daughters came, gave me a hug, and said, happy anniversary. <laughs> it was my wedding anniversary just two days ago. This thing works, friends. And if you don't believe me, look at my daughters. They've been here around you. 
Do they look like, ah. do they? Because they've seen a faith that works. A faith that has, the Lord has given experience to them that now, what can the devil do to us for the Christian to live is Christ and to die is gain. Friends, if somebody walks into this room with a machine gun and puts me against the wall and said, Oscar, either you will deny Christ or will shoot you, I'll say, can I get that on writing? Because I'm not going to neg neg negate the Lord. And if you shoot me, I'll see my wife. <laughs> what can he do to us if we don't look at the circumstances? Because that's the only thing that the devil can do, friends. He can touch your body. He can touch your finances. He can touch your circumstances. But he cannot touch the man. He cannot touch the woman that, whose faith is placed on the word that, that cannot be moved. On the anchor that cannot be shaken. He can't do anything. Tribulation, bring it on. It amazes me the Christians are afraid of tribulation. Are you kidding me? Tribulation is the opportunity for the Christian to shine. It is the opportunity for the Christian to live by faith. Because when you are hungry... You know that the Lord still supplies all your needs. When you are destitute, you know that the Lord still looks after you, even if you can't see it. Even if the world cannot see it. Are you alone? Do you feel alone? Some people feel alone. But it doesn't matter what you feel. You are not alone. He never, never leaves you. Never forsake you. So I'm just going to talk to the camera to the person that is now listening in their home to this message. I want to tell you something. I have an urgency on my message. I don't know if you picked that up. I've got an urgency. There is a number of people that are going to say yes to Jesus. When that number of people say yes to Jesus, he will come. Because there's no point of waiting for the ones that will, no matter what, will say no to Jesus. And you might be one of those people that will say yes to Jesus. And if you're waiting for an event in your life to say yes to Jesus, I want to tell you that you don't have tomorrow guarantee. But today, you can guarantee your eternity in Christ Jesus. If you're taking longer, you're making me wait. You're making the Lord wait. You don't know, friend, I never thought that I would bury my wife in 2018. Never thought that I would do that. She was a healthy looking woman. I never thought. You don't know what tomorrow comes. Today, if you hear his voice, if you have heard his voice, do not make your heart like a stone, but give yourself to Jesus. I'm assuming everybody here is being baptized. I'm assuming. But just in case, I'm going to ask the question, who has not been baptized here? Can I see your hands, please? Everybody has been baptized here. Everybody. Good. Fantastic. Now, the Lord needs to give you an experience. And you're thinking, okay, I don't want that one. <laughs> Whatever the experience, please don't think for a minute that my experience or my children's experience is worse than yours. It's not. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 tells us, There's no temptation overtaking you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful that will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And with the temptation, He will provide a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Not escape it, bear it. So whatever you're going through is as dramatic as important and as, as what I have gone through. Why is it that I feel that our tribulation has been easy? Because his yoke is easy. Because he is carrying my burdens. Because he is telling me, trust in me, and I just decided to do so. And my children have decided to do so. Whatever you're going through, friends, 
you got a mighty father with a mighty word full of promises all for you. You are going through what you can bear. Don't ever think, don't ever say, I cannot bear this. Because God is not a liar. If you're going through it, God has allowed it. Praise the name of the Lord. He knows what is best for you. And I needed this. And I'm going to tell you one thing more. And we finish with this. The devil is going to regret the day he touched Veronica Sunday. Because the amount of people that are going to come to the Lord because of it, he is going to regret it. Praise God for his mighty spirit. And praise God that he has given us enough faith. You already have it. It's already yours by inheritance. God bless you. Would you join me with me in prayer? Should we kneel? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word that is bigger than us. For your promises that are all fulfilling. We thank you for faith that you have given to every single one of us, which is sufficient. We thank you, Father, for all tribulations that in your wisdom you have allowed to come our way. If it wasn't for your protection, Father, the devil will kill us even now. But that that you have allowed to pass through is just for the benefit of ourselves and the benefit of others. I thank you, Father, for the testimony that you have given our family. I thank you for the testimony of faith that you have given my wife as a testimony to all of us. I thank you for her victory again. And I thank you, Father, because in Christ Jesus, we are more than conquerors. I thank you for all the people that are, that are kneeling down here and for those listening in their homes. I thank you for, in their behalf, for every single one of their tribulations. You are judge, you are wise, you know what you're doing. And I pray, Father, that if it's anyone here or anyone in their homes that have not fully surrendered to you, that they will do so today, not tomorrow, but today. I thank you, Father, and will continue to thank you for all eternity. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. God bless you. Well, as the Sabbath comes to an end, so does your old life. You have to be moved by that.